Hello everybody and welcome to Bardi with me, Mrs McGowan. This lesson is for Year 9 and Year 10 as it's a revision of a topic called organisation. The learning objective is to be able to recall heart structure and know some treatments for heart problems. At the top corner there you'll find the Google Classroom code. On there I'm going to pop on a related task, some extra exam questions that's going to enable you to find out how well this lesson has worked for you and allow me to give you some feedback. Please press pause if you need to go and grab a pen or some paper. If you've got a calculator that'd be great, if not don't worry, I'm going to work through a calculation with you. So our first question is how do substances move around the body? And the body has its own transport system that carries substances around the body. The systems involved include the heart, which is our focus of today. We need to think about blood vessels, which in itself will be a lesson. And to know what's in the blood and how it's being carried around the body. The body's transport system is called the circulatory system. Now, we need to be knowing what's actually carried in that circulatory system. So which gases do you think are transported to and from the body cells by the blood flowing in the circulatory system? I'll give you a minute to think about it. Please write down your answer on your paper. So hopefully you had a think and thought actually oxygen is needed by those cells. So is going to leave the blood vessel and go into the body cells. That gas is going to be used for respiration. And thinking about the respiration word equation, hopefully you named carbon dioxide as the gas that comes out from the body cells back into the blood system that needs to be released from the body. We said we needed to remind ourselves of types of blood and what it's actually carrying. And in the system today, you'll notice everything that's oxygen rich is going to be coloured in red. And any blood in the system that we look at that is lacking in oxygen, I'm not going to say it's empty of oxygen, it's just oxygen poor blood, will be blue in today's presentation. So all of the oxygen rich blood is traveling to the body cells, has high oxygen content and low carbon dioxide content. If you notice, we are not saying it has no carbon dioxide. It is low carbon dioxide. The oxygen poor blood is the opposite. It's blood traveling away from the body cells. It has low oxygen content, high carbon dioxide content compared to the oxygen rich blood. And we're very lucky that the arrangement of the circulatory system means that these two types of blood do not mix, which means it keeps it as efficient as possible at doing their job of delivering these gases to where they need to be. Now inside the heart, it's divided into two sections. Again, so this blood does not mix. And we're keeping with those same colours for oxygen rich side and oxygen poor side. Remember that the heart is always labelled as if it is in a body facing you. So the right side of the heart is on the left side of the diagram. And if you're struggling in an assessment or even with any work, pick up your diagram, place it on your chest if you need to. And then you will realise that the left side of the heart is the left side once you've picked it up. Now, 
Now, blood is pumped around the body by the heart and it takes about 30 seconds for blood to go once around the body and then back to the heart again. So this journey takes about 30 seconds. Blood is going to be travelling back up to the heart against gravity and it's going to enter the heart on the right side as it comes back. This blood needs to lose the carbon dioxide and pick up some more oxygen, so it needs to travel to the lungs. In the lungs, the blood gets rid of that waste carbon dioxide, collects some more oxygen, and it is then changed to that oxygen rich blood to go back to the heart. It's going to enter on the left side, and that is one complete. Um, journey of the blood around the body. The question I'm going to ask you to answer on your paper is why is the journey of the blood through the circulatory system called a double circulation? Write down your thoughts now. Answers will be on the next slide when you're ready. So here's your mark scheme, guys. It's called a double circulatory system because during one complete circuit of the body, blood passes through the heart twice. That would get you one mark if this was written as an exam question. To get your second mark, you could expand on that and say it goes to the lungs and it enters the heart and then gets pumped to the rest of the body. You can get acknowledged for talking about blood being pumped at different pressures. So I hope you've done really well there. OK, so the heart pumps blood around the circulatory system. The question for you to think about is what is the heart made of? Jot down your answer. So hopefully you realise that the heart is made of muscle tissue and the heart is made of muscle so it can contract and relax to do the pumping of the blood around our body. Just like any muscle in our body, it needs its own blood supply. So that it's going to get an oxygen supply for respiration. It's going to need glucose for that respiration. It also needs its waste products to be removed. So to do that, the exterior of the heart has got lots and lots of blood vessels, arteries and veins supplying the muscle tissue with that transport system. We've already seen the interior being split into two sections, the left side and the right side of the heart. But now I just want to dig a little bit deeper and just check we're OK with the names of the sides of the heart. Because each section of the heart is called a chamber and you'd be expected to name these four chambers. At this point, guys, you might want to press pause, make a very quick sketch and label this heart so that you have a reference point somewhere you can come back and revise from. I'm just going to go through how we say these words. An upper chamber is called an atrium and that is on both sides of the heart. So you must specify if we're talking about the right atrium or the left atrium. An atrium means a hallway, it's the first part to the heart that the blood enters. On both sides, the chambers are called ventricles. But we must again in our answer specify are we talking about the right ventricle and the left ventricle. If in doubt, always find that thicker heart muscle wall that I'm just going to show here that is on the left side of the heart. Now's your chance to press pause and have a little progress check. I'd like these questions answered and then I will go through the answers. They're actually an exam question. 
You've been asked to name one substance transported by the blood in the circulatory system. What is the main type of tissue in the heart wall? You're welcome to go back through my presentation if you need to find those answers. Question three, I'm asking you to look at the diagram I've popped there. You just need a letter to say which blood vessel takes blood to the lungs. And then as a recap of the previous slide, I want you to name the parts D and E on that diagram. Press pause and play when you're ready to move on. So let's go through the answers, guys. We asked you to name one substance is going to be a long list of options and any one from that list of glucose, oxygen, carbon dioxide, urea, water and hormones would be accepted. At this point, can I ask you to check your spellings, especially of glucose and oxygen, as they tend to be a little bit mixed up by some students. The main type of tissue in the heart, I bet you've all put muscle. We were talking about it earlier that it needs its own blood supply. The blood vessel in the diagram which takes blood to the lungs is B. As part of your revision, I'd like to perhaps find out the name of that blood vessel so that we can specify the real name of that artery. Name the parts D and E. D is a left atrium, E is a left ventricle. OK, guys, we're going to move on now. We've had a look at the heart structure, which is what the exam board has told me to tell you about and make sure that you have learned and that you are confident with. But I'm going to put something in the mix now. I'm going to actually ask you to compare and contrast what we do know, the human heart, with hearts that you never have had to study before. So don't be phased by it. Let's go for it. And here we go. I want to give you a diagram of a fish heart. Guys, I've never dissected a fish heart. I've never known how to label it. And I'm not phased by this question to be able to compare this with a real human heart. Because as long as we know the human heart, we're going to pick out some features of this fish heart. So go for things that we know are in both of the hearts. The word ventricle will be in both of our heart diagrams. The word atrium would be in both. So it has some similarities. So that would be my comparing. They both have an atrium. They both have a ventricle. But if you notice, the numbers are different. This fish heart has only got one ventricle. So it'd be a contrasting statement because our heart has two. This fish heart looks like it's only got the one direction of blood flowing through it. And this is the direction it would flow through. Blood enters this heart only once on its journey around the body. This is a single circulatory system. Whereas we know that our human heart has a double circulatory system. So we've already got a talking point of how they are different. Now that was like a talk through version of compare and contrast for a fish heart. I've done it again, guys. I've thrown at you a frog heart. It's looking a little bit more similar to a human heart at first glance. It's got a few more chambers, but let's drill down and really compare it with a human heart. And this is how I might structure a plan of an answer if I was being asked to compare a frog heart with a human heart. I'd put it in note form first before I wrote four sentences. The first thing I'd want to say is that the frog's heart has three chambers. I might even want to name those chambers in my full answer, but in my plan, three chambers will remind me to talk about them. And the same talking point of the human heart would be that the human heart has got four chambers, so we have a difference. I'd like you to use your literacy skills and think of connectives that would join that three chambers and the four chambers. On the frog's heart, I can see that the blood must be mixing in that ventricle. And it doesn't really mean 
that the oxygen rich blood is always going to go out of the same vessel. Whereas the human heart is structured so there's no blood mixing, which makes it much more efficient at delivering the oxygen and removing carbon dioxide. The frog's heart is also single circulatory. Because that blood does not go to the lungs and then back again. Whereas our heart is double circulatory. Because the blood, the same blood cell will go to the heart twice. My final point there, guys, is valves. I've popped it in the middle to try and emphasise that actually both of these hearts have valves. A word that I've just popped up that we now need to make sure that we're all happy with their function and how we actually spot them in a diagram. So in a compare and contrast question, it is great to have things that are different and you're allowed to say what things are the same within two diagrams. So let me just go over heart valves. The chambers of the heart are separated by these things called valves and their job is to prevent blood flow from going backwards. You get a mark in exam for saying their job is to stop backflow. And we have them between the right atrium and the right ventricle. We have them between the left atrium and the left ventricle. We also have them at the ends of the blood vessels that are taking the blood away. So when the pressure drops in the heart, the blood doesn't fall back into the heart. It's always going to be going in the correct direction. The valves between the atria and the ventricles are connected to the inner walls of the heart by tough tendons. So they can't be forced past themselves and allow the blood to get through. In a future lesson, we might look at leaking valves and the impact they would have on a person's health. But for today, we're going to be looking at the healthy heart valves, meaning that they close and they open and just prevent that backflow of blood. There's a valve closed and the tendons have been pulled tight so that they are under some pressure holding that blood in that area and stopping it from going back up into the atria. Now this is a bit guys if you did have a calculator please grab it now or your phone and in physics lessons and in chemistry lessons I think you guys are used to pretty big numbers to try and blow your mind. Well, I want to show you some numbers that hopefully make you realise how fantastic our heart actually is and why we should be looking after it. So just do a bit of number crunching. How many heartbeats? And I'm going to give you some different time frames for us to calculate how many heartbeats. On average, we're going to go that the heart beats 70 times per minute, and that is an average. So how many beats do you think that heart would be doing in one hour? How many times in one day do you think that heart would have been beating? Multiply that up to tell me how many heartbeats you think that would be in one year. And then how many times a heart's beating in a 70 year old? And then I can go and tell my dad this magic number. So press pause, jot down your numbers, however you want to work it. When you're ready, press play and the answers will be there for you. So let me show you the workings so you can check your own work. In one hour, you should have 70 beats per minute times 60 because that's the number of minutes in one hour. It's quite a big number, guys. 4,200 beats in just that one hour, the time that you might be doing your biology work. In one day, we're going to take that number forward and times it by 24. If you made an error in your one hour answer, but you took that number forward and times it by 24, you would still get a mark if this was a calculation. 
that number starts to get a bit scary big. 100,800. In one year, 36,792,000 beats. In 70 years, I wonder if you got 2 billion, 575 million, 440,000 beats. And that has been on average. If this person's exercised, then that number would be a lot higher. It's on average because as we sleep, the heart rate does drop. And I hope that number has just gone, whoa, I need to look after my heart because it's got a lot of beats to do yet. You could perhaps even work out for your age how many beats on average your heart has been doing. OK, can we just pop a new little sub note in your notes, guys, so we know that we've had the heart structure up until now. And moving forward, we're just going to look at some problems associated with the heart. And here I've popped a diagram showing you a healthy artery that has been cut in half so we can look down it as if it was a tube when we're looking down it and then I've popped one that's got some fatty material in that vessel wall and of course we should all be aiming to have that healthy artery that allows the blood to pass through with no restriction it's allowing maximum amount of blood through which means it's carrying all that oxygen or all that carbon dioxide um, to the place it needs to be. Now the fatty material deposit, the gap where blood can flow has actually shrunk. And that's called the lumen. Any gap in a tube is called the lumen. And if that's shrunk, it's going to restrict blood flow. It could be starving organs and cells of oxygen. So bear that one in mind that we do not want that fatty material there. And in future revision, we'll find out what might have popped that there. Some lifestyle choices or some health issues that has meant that that has built up. But not in today's lesson. Instead, I want to talk about, well, how could we help a person that has got that fatty material? So in an exam question, they could show you that artery as a diagram showing you that there's a blockage at build up of fatty material and then they might show you a solution as part of your revision i'm hoping you've remembered what a stent does and i've always taught this as a stent is like a tent they pop it in the blood vessel and they put it up they open up that stent and it holds out the blood vessel to allow blood to flow through it if you've noticed the fatty material is still there, it has just been pushed out to the side because the stent will hold that blood vessel open and the blood flow will resume and help those surrounding cells and organs. So as a quick reminder, that stent's going to keep the artery open. So blood or oxygen, it doesn't matter which way you word that in an exam answer, can pass through the heart muscle. Now, that was one treatment was using a stent. The other option is a statin. I'm trying to show you there, guys, that this is going to be in a tablet form. It's medication. And a statin reduces cholesterol. It's going to try and break down that fatty deposit, that blockage itself, to make it actually disappear so the artery can open up and so more blood and oxygen can pass through. This is not an instant result. This is going to take time for that medication to build up in the person's body and for it to have an effect. With all medication, there could be likely side effects. So a person might want to decide which treatment to have or the urgency of the treatment. A person might not have time to wait for a statin to work. They might have to straight away go for a stent because it works literally from the moment it's fitted. So that's going to help us have this again, this compare and contrast. I'm going to lay it out exactly the same way. So you can always pause it to jot down some notes. In the middle there, I'm going to 
opening statement that if I wanted to compare a stent with a statin, that they are both trying to allow blood to flow to heart muscle. Because let's remember that heart will have arteries and we need to keep that muscle supplied with oxygen. On the stent side though, I would want to say that that requires an operation. It's quite a big operation and all the risks associated with it need to be thought through. Compared to taking tablets, that medication doesn't need an operation, so it does avoid any risks linked to the procedure of infection, of any issues with the anaesthetic. There's no recovery time needed. A stent, as I've already said, they work straight away. And in some cases, people do not have the time for the medication to start to work. Once a stent's been fitted, it will last for years. Yes, that person will have checkups, but once it's fitted, it will carry on doing its job day after day without really any more thought or treatment. But the statin could have possible side effects, which might make a person want to stop taking them. Plus doses can be missed by the patient very easily, forget a tablet, which then might limit its effectiveness. If ever you get asked to evaluate heart treatment, you are welcome at the end to give your own conclusion, which one perhaps you would want to choose if it was for you and say why. There is not a right or wrong answer with that conclusion, but if you are asked for one, please just pick a treatment and just give one of these statements as to say that's the thing that made it for you. And so guys, here's your final progress check of the lesson. It's a recall quiz about the structure of the heart. If you could write numbers one to eight down your page. One to four, I'd like you to label the chambers of the heart diagram shown. Number five, I'd like to know why is our circulatory system known as double circulatory system. Number six, what type of blood vessel carries blood to the heart? I want to know the blood vessel that's feeding that chamber number one in the heart diagram. Number seven, using your notes, give one similarity between the human heart and the frog heart. And number eight, Give two differences between the human heart and the frog heart. Please press pause. The answers will play as soon as you are ready to mark them. So here we go. Let's just quickly mark them and you are done for the day. Number one, right atrium. Just check your spellings. Number two was the right ventricle. Number three was the left atrium. Number four, left ventricle. Number five, for one mark, you'd have said that blood enters the heart twice. For your second mark, because it travels to the lungs and the body. The blood vessel that was going into chamber one on your heart diagram would be a vein. It's the biggest vein in the body called the vena cava. For some similarities, guys, they both have two atria. They have an atrium each. And number eight, the frog only has one ventricle, or the blood mixes, or the frog's called a single circulatory system. If you went from the side of the human, you'd have put, put that the human has two ventricles, the blood doesn't mix, and the human is called the single circulatory system. Hope you really please yourselves. So that's the end of me then, guys. Just another recap of Google Classroom. If you haven't joined me yet, please come and find me. You can have it on your phone and the activity is mobile friendly. You need the class code to make sure it's the biology. And so that's me that's marking it. I've really enjoyed doing this lesson. Please come on Google Classroom and give me some feedback. Tell me what you do like and what you don't like. And I will change things for next time. Thank you very much. Take care. See you soon.